testing for software developers who don't know security at all. Um, so this is a very interesting topic that has been wildly popular the last couple of months. And I'm personally very interested in this topic too. So I'm curious um, to see what he's going to tell us today and how all of you can make your projects more secure. So please welcome Sai. Thanks. So, okay. Um, it's, I can't really see you guys, but uh, it looks like it filled up pretty good for like 2 p.m. Uh, talk based on Java stuff. Um, I will just give you a quick introduction to me or myself, and uh, we can show you why and what and how we can do all this fancy automated security testing stuff. Um, it's not necessarily this uh, order. Um, if you have questions, uh, maybe you can raise your hands and maybe I will see them, but probably not, or you can just scream at me. Um, and Let's give it a go. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm a system developer. I do Java backend stuff mostly. I do Kubernetes and cloud stuff, and I'm trying to get into security. Um, I'm also a co-organizer of the Karlsruhe DevOps meetup. Um, I work for Cynix. Just a quick shout out. Um, we do mostly Java development for uh, our customers with uh, their for their special needs and stuff. Um, our slogan is code with attitude, so uh, we try not to work for uh, arms dealers or people who do nuclear energy stuff. Um, yeah, we, do also con we also do consulting and uh, we have glitter shirts and they paid for our camp ticket. So just a quick shout out. If you're ever in southern uh, Germany and you're looking for a job. So, um, thank you for listening. Any questions? No, I got questions. Um, is any of you directly involved with a software product, developing it, running it, maintaining it? Surprise. <laughs> uh, who of you uses Java? OK. Um, the talk will, or first part, um, will run mainly with uh, Maven context. So I hope it's not too far fetched for people who haven't seen this. Um, I think it's quite self explanatory. Um, uh, who of you uses Docker or Kubernetes or something container in production? <laughs> okay. Uh, who of you uh, scans your software regularly for security problems or known vulnerabilities? Who of you runs? software in production where they know they have uh, known uh, security vulnerabilities. OK. Um, I think we get back to this later on. OK. So what's the problem with software security issues? What could go wrong with uh, software that has not only technical issues, but also security stuff where people could break in and do bad stuff? Well. Um, you could use your, lose your business data or your customer's business data. You could also use your actual end customer data, which is like a very hard topic. Uh, I think it has been quite interesting in Germany in like forever, but uh, since 2018, the GDPR kicked in in Europe, and apparently a lot of companies have never thought about securing their users or customers' personal data. I'll have an example about this later on. Um, security issues could cause service interruptions, like somebody is uh, trying to attack your web server. If your web server goes down, your business is fucked. You can serve your customers. You can make money. Um, yeah, well, anyone can think about what happens. You could use or you could have industry mill function. Um, we have the Kritis infrastructure in Germany, um, where we uh, it's or it's uh, infrastructure that's used for your daily life and that's absolutely necessary, like um, sewage cleaning stuff and electricity and stuff like that. And maybe you've heard uh, about deaths that actually happened um, because. Um, Automated cars drove over someone because they thought it was like um, some kind of 
paper bag flying over the street. That's a technical error, but this could also possibly be used by a hacker if you have a security issue in your automated car that or people have shown that they could remotely stop cars, start the ignition, brakes, and whatever. OK. Um, does anyone know about Equifax? It's like the German Schufa. They do credit monitoring for their consumers. So if you apply for credit, um, if you have trouble paying your bills, it will, could, could happen that if you live in the US, um, you show up in their databases. Um, in 2017, they were hacked. They, uh, hackers, some hackers breached their web server through a vulnerability in Apache Struts. It's an open source project where you can uh, build web views. Um, turns out that Struts was, or had been patched. Um, there was an official patch for Struts for like four weeks, and apparently Equifax didn't know about this, or nobody cared. And um, people were able to infiltrate their servers and take out a lot of personal data, like uh, I think 130 or 43 million social security numbers. And if you know about the US social security system, it's a number that you get assigned by birth, and you can never change that. And there's a lot of services where you can like change your passwords. You call them on the phone, and you have to give them the last four digits of your social security number, and that's their uh, authentication for you. So this is pretty bad. Um, there was also a lot of uh, credit card numbers involved. And um, well, you can think about what happens next. Uh, vulnerabilities can also happen in the platform that you use your um, to run your servers. Uh, Germans might know this under the name Panama Papers, or maybe everyone. Um, I don't think we have time for this, but they had a bad Drupal version that did not upgrade this for their web servers. And well, that turned out not so good for them. So why would you not patch your software? Well, there's negligence. So you just like. You don't care. You don't have the time. It's a priority problem. Um, your uh, product manager is like, no, we need the feature. Maybe you might be preoccupied uh, by doing performance tests or something that you prioritize higher. It could happen. Um, you might not have the training. Like when I started uh, interesting myself in this whole security thing, I had no idea what to do. I'm not even, I've been doing this for like two years now, and I'm far from being an expert in, in software security. I have more like the average basic knowledge. Um, so you might like the inside, or you could just say security is not my department. Um, I've seen people at customers that claim that they are software developers, and the company has a security team, a pen testing team, they have a test engineering team, and yeah, people that change your diapers uh, in the morning, I don't know. Um, OK. And there's the, to, to tackle all these problems, there's the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a, uh, I think it's a nonprofit organization. And they give out a top 10 list of application security risks. Um, and sometimes they renew it, so I think the last one was from 2017. And um, what we are trying to tackle today is the top nine. It's about using components with known vulnerabilities. So this is like um, somebody has found a vulnerability in like struts, and they will report it to someone at Apache or at the struts project, and they would um, the report is publicly available. So everyone can see it, and everyone can also write a scanner for this. Um, you might ask the question, why do we start with a 9 and not with the top 1 problems? Well, you can have all the top 8 problems and many, many more inside uh, third-party libraries that you use. And so we try to get the easiest way um, to tackle this problem, and it's also you can learn a lot by this. Okay, so what can we do? 
to address the problem. We can search for known vulnerabilities. There's public databases uh, where we can, everyone, also the bad guys, but also the good guys, uh, can look for vulnerabilities and fix them and see what, uh, what they have to do, what versions they have to patch to. Um, that's pretty easy, technically, because there's tooling for this. We have to implement a process to fix it. You know, like, you find a vulnerability, but you need the time to fix it. There's priorities, there's features to do, there's other stuff to, to address, um, and you have to find a way who is going to fix or to patch or to delete vulnerable software. And I think that's the hardest part for a company. And I personally would also treat security issues like technical debt. Like, the longer it takes you to patch this, the harder it is to upgrade or to patch, because there will be new vulnerabilities, there will be new features. Every one of you knows this. Like, if you, if you wait for weeks to patch software, technical issues, vulnerabilities, whatever, and the software progresses, it's much harder to fix it and to update it. So, and also, well, I think the best thing is also always to automate everything. So I don't, I don't want to know, like, it's Monday morning, 10 a.m., I have to r run a vulnerability test. No, it should be automatically, you know? Like, I don't, it's, it's the same as with uh, unit tests, integration tests, performance tests. There's software, it changes, so it should be automatically built, it should be automatically tested, and it should be automatically uh, scanned for security issues. OK, so let's check this out, how we can uh, find dependency in third-party libraries. I've chosen to uh, make a quick uh, Maven project. I hope uh, if you haven't used Maven or Java before, you still get the message. Um, we will scan for uh, components in Docker images, um, because like, stuff like Drupal could be packaged into a Docker image, where you put your actual web server or web, sec web software or website in. Um, and if you've got time, we can also scan our API later on, because we are doing a web API or web app. OK. Um, and well, I said we want to automate it. So I tried to show you something that could be in a continuous delivery pipeline right now. So this is from the Jenkins Blue Ocean plugin. It's an open source tool. Um, every Java developer probably has used it before. And these are steps that. I think are in some uh, um, respect necessary for modern software development. Like um, you, you want to um, unit test your stuff. You need to package your new software so you can use it. You need to upload this artifact so it's uh, safe for later. Um, you run a Docker build if you use Docker um, and push the Docker image to the Docker registry so it can be deployed to some servers and. This is just a demo project. Obviously, usually you, you would add more tests. And maybe it would be deployed to production or to test systems automatically in this uh, pipeline. So we could add additional steps to this pipeline to in increase uh, the steps and improve um, our software security scanning part. Um, I have added three demo steps. Um, one is running a dependency check, uh, one is running a container security scan, and one would be running an API security test. It could also look like this. Yellow usually means in Jenkins that the build has been unstable, so it has been built. And there's no major breaking point, um, but something's fishy, so you have to look into the build. Um, I'll show you this later on. I think um, the build should always build. There's people who say, um, if you have a vulnerability or if you have bad tests, well, tests should break the build, in my, in my opinion. But vulnerabilities are a little tricky, because it might, you might have to fix two vulnerabilities at once. But you, don't, you can't do both at a time sometimes. Like maybe there's one of them is missing a patch, but you still want to fix the other one, so your build has to run. So in my opinion, you should have some visual or some alert that the build has not fully 
uh, or the pipeline has not fully run, um, like by setting it un to unstable. Um, and at the teams I usually work at, um, we have big dashboards for our development processing, and um, we usually show um, tra uh, like traffic lights, uh, so dashboards um, that will show by color if the builds uh, on the most um, most needed branches, like the master branch or um, any stage systems, were fully built. And so it would you would directly get visual feedback if something has happened by the automatic build process. So you don't have to necessarily check every build, but uh, rather you, you get a visual alert if something went wrong. And then you have to like implement this process, how to actually fix this problem or address the problem. OK. Um, so what's a vulnerability? Vulnerability. Wikipedia says um, the quality or state of being exposed to the possibility of being attacked or harmed, either physically or emotionally. Um, so something might happen to your software, and it's in third-party libraries. The problem is that it might be publicly known because you haven't patched the software. And well, how would you know this? Um, there's a public reference database, or multiple ones, um, that lists common vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, or, well, a CVE, common vulnerabilities and exposures, is actually a description for a vulnerability. So I've uh, taken the Equifax example with Apache Struts. Um, so you see there is the um, one of this or this is the vulnerability description for the Apache Struts problem in this particular version. Um, you see there's, uh, on the left, lower left side, there's a base score that says something critical, something, and you don't have to be a security expert to know that you should probably address this problem. Um, and it has some information, and you get uh, infos about what's the actual problem in this struts version. Like, uh, there's something uh, content crafted package you could send to this thing to run code on somebody else's web server. Um, and there's also some scoring and uh, some exploitability scores. And there's much information that you don't actually need at the first place when you get started. Um, it's more like an in-depth information thing later on. OK, um, I'll jump into the Maven and dependency part. And this is just an example how Maven dependencies in a modern Java application would look like. Um, I have written, or actually, I have just uh, generated a Maven project. And um, I have added some. Uh, some dependencies and third-party libraries that I think are the minimum that I would use in every new Java Spring Boot application that also runs something web service. So we have the uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we have the Spring Boot starter. Spring Boot is a framework on top of Java that actually does a lot for you, so you don't have to program everything and just can focus on your business case and don't have to do the Java basics. And it's the most common uh, Java framework right now. Um, so you can add these starters to this. That's third-party libraries that bring certain functionality, like. Um, Obviously, we make an API, so we have to secure it. So we need a starter for security that does authorization and authentication stuff um, out of the box. So you can just add little snippets into your code, and Spring Boot will actually have this all programmed out. Um, we want to do an API, so we need a web starter um, to run a web server. Um, actuator can give you uh, runtime metrics and information about the health uh, of your uh, application. I think this one is absolutely necessary if you want to monitor your uh, application later on. And then we have a test scope. So this will not actually run in the production 
compilation of the software um, where we can test the actual uh, Spring Boot framework and also the Spring security that comes with Spring Boot Security Starter. And it's not, you don't have to necessarily understand all the parts of this and, and, and become a Java developer to actually use this. But I think every language has, that has a dependency management framework can do stuff like this. Oh, and obviously, uh, we added the vulnerable Apache Strats version, so we can find something that we actually want to fix or whitelist, maybe. OK, and the problem is right now that these six or seven dependencies um, bloat the software. You see them on the left side, and they bloat the software. And they download like 80 more dependencies themselves. And they're called transient dependencies. So every dependency brings more libraries. Um, and they bring more libraries and so on. So it's a big bloated library. And well, I wanted to say fuck up, but it's depending on what you're actually using. Spring Boot is very, very well maintained, and they are, uh, have a quite quick reaction time if they find something. Um, OK, I've just said this, six Maven dependencies. You can find this on GitHub. Um, and uh, I will tell you something more about it later on. Um, and almost 80 transitive or 70 transitive dependencies, so it's like 80 overall. And they can all have vulnerabilities. And you want to at least patch the ones that are publicly known for having security issues. So it's like low-hanging fruit. And everyone can find this, and you should too. So what can we do to find vulnerable dependencies um, or third-party libraries? There's tooling for this. And this is a really big hype right now in the software industry. Um, there's quite a lot of vendors who add pro uh, products for this. Uh, GitHub, uh, I I'm not big on advertising for paid services, but GitHub does this um, for open source public software. So if you have created a GitHub repository, as the owner, you will see when GitHub finds a vulnerability in your dependency system. If you use one of the big uh, programming frameworks, and they will, will show you an, order, an, an, an alert for this. And if you set the correct notification settings, you will also get an email for this. Uh, this is pretty nice. And a couple months ago, they added uh, a system that can also patch your vulnerabilities or patch your third-party libraries. Um, and well, you might think if the owner sees one of the problems, that's OK, because it's still hidden. Nobody else sees it. But if someone forks your repository, they are the owner of the fork. So they will get a notification if GitHub finds the same vulnerability in their uh, repo. Uh, for the demo and for this whole talk, I'm using dependency check because it's an open source tool. It's um, uh, in, in the open web application security project. So if you contribute or if you uh, donate money to the OWASP project, some of it will uh, allow the uh, maintainers of dependency check to make the software better. And it's really well maintained. They have uh, quick, they react quickly if you ask them something or if you set up a pull request or something like that. OK, how does it work? Um, there's this database run by a, an American uh, government organization publicly um, where you can get the CVE data. So that's the database where the actual vulnerabilities and their descriptions and scoring are held. And dependency check downloads this into a local database. And then you can run a dependency check in Maven. You can also use Docker if you're not using Maven. You can use a command line client to check your software. Um, I think for Maven um, or Gradle, that's the same for Java um, software. It's really easy to use it this way, but it's up to you. In the end, you should check this in any way. It's not necess necessarily the best one. Uh, OK, let's just see how this works out. OK, so I have, uh, for the guys who, who know Java and Maven, I have uh, um, programmed a Maven goal for this. Oops. And let's just run this check and see what it tells us. And it takes a couple seconds. Um, in the demo repo, I have disabled the automatic update. 
Um, so it, if you run this, if you check this out, and if you haven't never used a dependency check before, um, you will be tr uh, told to update your database beforehand. So some vulnerabilities were found. So our build broke. Um, so this will uh, end in a uh, exit code one. So anything different from zero is bad. And here you can see the uh, vulnerabilities that were actually found. So we have Jackson data bind. This is the, uh, a, a uh, can, can you read this in the back? Thumbs up? OK. Um, it's, it's a JSON parser that you can use to, uh, for FOIA application. It's pretty well known. And this is one of the transient dependencies. I have not actually uh, chosen to use this, but it comes with one of the uh, Spring Boot dependencies. Then there's Spring Security. Uh, and actually, this is an actual vulnerability. And um, there is a patch for this in 2991 hotfix. Um, but the Spring Boot version that actually brings this dependency has not yet been upgraded for this. So this is uh, a, uh, if, you, if you have a process for fixing this, you could manually upgrade this to 2991, for example, and then this should work out. If we have time later on, or if you join my workshop tomorrow, you, we, can, we can play around with this. Um, the Spring Security Core, this is actually a false positive. So Spring Security Core has a or has had a problem in 5.0 something, and they have fixed it. But somehow, this is still uh, in the vulnerability database. So the vulnerability database will still have the information that this is actually uh, problematic. And this is for uh, authentication stuff and authorization. Um, so if this were still an issue, and you're using authorization uh, annotations in, in, in Java, you should probably upgrade this. Um, and then there's our good struts vulnerability, which has like 10 vulnerabilities. And it's really old. It's from 2017. And the comments file upload is just another one that comes with struts. So we won't care about this. Um, what's the cool thing about dependency check? Oh, I forgot. Um, the app itself does nothing. It doesn't even hello world. It's just this is the basic what you get if you use these dependencies. You, use, you get a web, uh, a web server. You get uh, a login screen because we use security. And you could never log in because you have no way to find any user data. Uh, OK. Dependency check not also gives you the command line uh, references, but also generates an HTML report that you can use for other stuff. And um, if you like search for the struts problem. Whoops. There you go. Um, you find a description. What's the actual problem here? This, is, this one is passed from the CV about struts. And um, there's some more information about what happens here. And then they have a list of all the vulnerabilities found. And um, there's a, a very good description, what's up actually happening here, and some scoring. And this is the point where you can actually learn just by, by using this dependency check and, and checking out the, the HTML report, you will find these vulnerable third party libraries. And the report will also tell you what's, what could potentially happen here. And um, sometimes there is also a link to exploit DB. <laughs> So exploit, uh, this is the big, the big one, the critical 10-0 uh, parser thing that I mentioned earlier. And you can also find working exploits that you can use to test, please, only your own uh, servers, nobody else's. Um, and usually, this is a very good way to learn about vulnerabilities if you find them. If you have no idea how to actually what, how, how big the problem is, you look for in the report for exploit DB links or check some of the other descriptions. And some of them are very, very helpful in, in understanding this stuff. Um, one, one more thing. The report also lets you. Um, has a prepared XML statement that you can use to whitelist uh, false positives. Oop. 
lips. Oh. Spring security. There you go. So we can we want to wipe the Spring Security Core because we have read uh, reports that this is actually false positive. So we go to the uh, suppression button, and if the CSS is working, we ah oh yeah there it is. We get some uh, XML data that we can uh, use for a configuration file, and we can just copy this and add this to the. Uh, I think I've opened it before to a suppressions file that we have configured in our Java file. And now this CVE that I have uh, suppressed here, so this one, uh, will no longer show up because the dependency check will now whitelist it because I've configured this XML file to uh, be for whitelisting. Or somehow I miss something that. Okay, uh, I did an upgrade of the um, um, dependency check plugin earlier uh, to prepare for the talk, and apparently something in the XML description changed. Um, so you just have to trust me that this will would actually have whitelisted the false positive. Okay, uh, let's go on with some more. Fun stuff. Okay, you can also use the report to um, run some uh, report, other reporting, or to, to use it in other reporting tools. Like this is Sonar, um, a code quality plug, a code quality tool that shows you uh, trends and stuff. And uh, we don't have time for this. So Docker, um, who in here has actually scanned their Docker containers for problems? Three people, very good. Um, Docker is, uh, well, you, you, use, you use Docker you, so you know how it works. You pull some container that, that someone on the internet has built for you. And um, this is like the YOLO style of uh, running software. And there's also a scanner. It's called Claire. It uh, has been written by CoreOS, um, now owned by Red Hat, now owned by IBM, uh, I think. Um, they do uh, container stuff and Kubernetes stuff. And so apparently, they needed some container scanning uh, utilities. And it works similarly. They also query the NIST database. Um, but they host the vulnerabil vulnerability data in a, another database on your local servers. And they run a class server. And you can run a client that actually feeds your Docker container to the server. And the server will scan all the Docker layers and tell you what's happening. OK. Uh, So I have started a Clear server and a database on my uh, on my machine. Um, usually, you would have to run these servers in your infrastructure somewhere. And I have packaged this app that we wrote earlier into a container, and I have used. Uh, where is it? There you go. Uh, I've used a basic Java image for Java 8. It's one of the official uh, images um, from OpenJDK. Um, and let's see what happens to this. So this takes a um, couple of seconds. So the, um, and we're pretty late, so we'll just go to the, you see a lot of red. and. Uh, Earlier, I ran this test, and it found that the, uh, the, the image contained 96 vulnerabilities, and they are all already in the base image. So this has no, uh, none of the vulnerabilities that we found in the Java application. This is everything you get when you download a new OpenJDK package. And this is the slim one, so it's not as bloated. And there's fun stuff like glibc, obviously, um, and util Linux, and you can actually uh, also whitelist false positives, um, or you can also whitelist uh, stuff that you know that are not um, not applying to your software. Like 
if you have a problem with the SSH daemon, you, someone could probably break into your server, but in Docker, you usually don't open the port, so it should not be so hard to just not scan for it anymore. Um, and the, then you can, uh, you can also set thresholds. I will not show the examples now because I'm a little behind. Um, so you could uh, choose only to see high or critical or medium vulnerabilities and upwards, and everything else is auto-approved. And to run this in continuous integration, you might have to um, add some more fun stuff. Um, typically, if you run stuff in modern uh, build tools like GitLab CI, GitHub automated tools, you won't necessarily have uh, the power or the, the time to set up infrastructure, and you don't need it. So you maybe don't want to run a Claire server that you have to care for all the time. You don't want to manage another Postgres database. Um, so what you can do is, inside continuous integration, just before the scan, the actual scan happens, you can start um, a database container and a Claire scanner container. And this guy, Armin C something, I can, he has a French sounding name and I can pronounce it. Uh, you can find his repos on GitHub. Um, he, he actually came up with this solution. So just before you run the scan, you start those Docker containers. And after the scan, you just stop them again. Um, and I have obviously just started them on my machine. So after the scan, I would just stop them. Uh, the demo repo contains a Jenkins file, so if you use Jenkins, you can also run all these tests. Um, you might have to play around a little uh, in Jenkins with um, the um, credentials of, of the Jenkins user and uh, the permissions that they have. Um, there's also uh, public repositories um, that do the scan for you, like Quay is an alternative to Docker Hub. So you can choose to host your repositories with Quay, and they will do a scan for you. Uh, GitHub or GitLab offers a, uh, a method to scan your container for you and give you a hint about um, broken stuff. Um, OK. And I think we have some more time to do a quick, quick API scan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've started the uh, application on my local machine, and I could uh, now run a zap. Uh, I'm out of time. I'm so sorry. OK. Um, so let's start over. Sorry. Um, we can use another OWASP tool. It's called Z Attack Proxy to uh, actually attack our API and dynamically scan it to find actual vulnerabilities that it's serving, like stuff like that offers SQL injection or cross-site scripting. And um, what we, this is not important, what we do here is just use Docker again, because we have great Docker and container fans. Um, so we can download a um, Docker container that they provide that actually has the scanner built in, and then you can just run it against your website. And I will just show you the report that, that is actually coming out of this. And I've taken the liberty um, a couple of weeks ago to scan the Cynix website. So please don't hack us. Um, and the scanner shows, and this is very, very cool about this tool, um, also a, a great description about the actual vulnerabilities, because like, I have no idea what the X-Frame method option header is. Does any of you? Another two people, <laughs> very good. Um, but it actually, it's, uh, it, I think in the solution, there is always a description what the actual problem here is and what you can do to fix it. And there's also references um, where, this is, where there's a description for this and where you can find, are you OK? Good. Uh, where you can find more options what you can do. Um, I will run one. More attack, I think. 
Yeah, this also takes some time, so I've already done this before for you. And um, if you run the, the, uh, this against the Cynic site, nowadays we run WordPress, uh, so you will find um, a lot of warnings that might or might not be critical. Um, we have a company that does the page for us, so maybe we should address them with this. And then again, um, this is just a spider. So this one, uh, this attack will go to, I think I, I configured Zunix DE. Um, somewhere, there. And this will start at a landing page that you configure at a target, and it will just spider all the links inside this page and just traverse into deeper into the, um, into the page you give it. You can also run this um, and feed it an open API spec. Um, so if you develop an, your own application, you usually know which API endpoints you are serving. Um, you might generate this using tools like Swagger, if you know this. Um, but let's say you have like three endpoints, like login or, uh, I don't know, shop and web page, something like that. You might tell the tool which, uh, which API endpoints or which URLs to look for, so you save the time um, that it would use to spider all these links. And the longer it runs, obviously, the more it's uh, able to find. OK. Um, I'm a little sorry that I had to rush through the end. Um, if you want to, to try this more in depth, um, Daniel and I are hosting a two-hour workshop about this, uh, where we will um, show you more the usage of the tools, and you can ask questions and might just get your hands dirty and try this yourself. Um, tomorrow, I think it's 3.15 uh, p.m. It has been rescheduled for a couple times, so you m should look into the three-headed monkeys uh, schedule, I guess. Um, if, you don't if you can make it, you can also uh, stop by our village, Fake and Business World, um, and um, ask your questions. And, well, usually I would uh, discuss this in the end. This is like, this is about the process. What can you do? Um, maybe one sentence about this. In my current team, if, if a vulnerability is found, the creator of the current pull request is also responsible to fix this as soon as possible. Um, we have a zero vulnerability um, policy. So anything that is found has to be fixed um, immediately. Um, if we found something on our production uh, code, um, we will also have a job that scans this nightly. And uh, the first one to be in the office or the one on call also is responsibility to, uh, responsible to at least look into the issue. So they could find out oh, it's, it's a false positive. They might just suppress it. They could find out that it's a horrible, horrible, bad <laughs> possibility to uh, bring your own your, your enterprise down, so they might want to patch it immediately. Um, but this is mainly up to you. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, this is like the most interesting part for a company and a development team. Thank you. All right, we have a couple of minutes left for questions. So if you want to ask Sai a question, please come to one of the microphones in the front or in the back and ask your question. All right, I don't see any questions at the moment. So if you, oh, well, there is one. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is about uh, handling false positives. OK. And you, you already showed an example. And especially dealing with something like Zap, you get a lot of false positive. Yeah. Um, but sometimes doors are pretty hard, uh, like uh, stuff in libraries which you actually don't use, right? So if you use APIs that are not vulnerable, 
And uh, I mean, uh, talking to development teams, I know that they spend most of their time handling exceptions. Do you have some uh, re general recommendation or could you share some experience regarding that? Um, especially in dynamic scanning um, with URLs or APIs or web servers, this is like really time consuming. Um, I can maybe share an example that I've, I've seen in a uh, team of a friend of mine. Um, they run API tests every night, and when they started this, they just sat down for a couple of days, actually, and uh, because they have a very big application that has grown over the years with a big, big API. Um, and they scanned this, and with, with the open, I speci uh, open API specification that they had generated earlier, they scanned their app and then they actually sat down and checked every vulnerability that Zaps bat out. So, and, and I think that's the only way to do it. You have to take the time and, and get all of those. And sorry, if you're at a point where you have zero new vulnerabilities or zero vulnerabilities found that you think are worth fixing, then you can um, do, for example, a weekly task or a nightly build that checks your API. And if something new is found, you have to fix it according to your policy. But I don't think there's a good way to do this differently. Well, you can, you can always, uh, if you have like libraries that are vulnerable in, in, and that you don't really need, I'm a biggest, the biggest fan of deleting your code if you don't need it, or deleting or uh, black holing APIs that you don't need. So I think it's, it's not, if, you are, um, if you're new to this, you should always uh, maybe talk to your security team, or if you're not sure, to the networking team, or if you're the networking team yourself, you should probably uh, think about your firewall rules and stuff like that. Um, but I think you have to address every vulnerability that is found. That's painful. All right, then uh, maybe let's do one last question from the back. OK, th thank you for your talk. Do you have any, do you have any experience with Graal VM or Quarkus? Because if you have all this bloat in your containers, it's easy to get confused and to run the bare necessities. Um, it could be interesting to have ex experiences with, with uh, more or less bare metal or, or, or bare, bare code containers without any operating system. Well, I think it's, um, it's a general rule to use as, as little software to run your code on as, as you do. It's also a, one of the Docker best practices, I think. Um, in Docker, you can use the official, like in, in, in Java, you can use the open JDK official Alpine images, and they come, if you download them right now, they won't come with any vulnerabilities. Um, the, a little problem with the, with the scanners that I have used um, is that stuff like GraalVM doesn't have a container, or it's stuff that Google provides if you use JIP. Um, if you know this one, um, it will uh, dynamically create containers, and they are not really containers in the Docker sense, so the scanner can't actually scan them. Um, I think these are projects that you have to rely on the maintainers to find vulnerabilities and fix it. But it's also, it's also more easy to handle it, because you can just upgrade your running systems like nightly or something like that, or every week, every hour. All right, um, we're out of time. So thanks so much, Sai, for the talk.